Let's go ahead and go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Start reading in verse 1. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in the vine. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. We'll start reading right there. But um, there's some really interesting truths that we can learn from here. Some of the things we see in this passage, uh, if you're not careful, if we ta- start taking it out of context, um, a lot of times people will take some of these verses and use it to prove you can lose your salvation. And we absolutely reject uh, that the Bible teaches anywhere that you can lose your salvation. But I want us to go through this and, and uh, see some key things. But you know, the first thing, notice you know how it mentions Jesus as the vine. Jesus is that true vine. That's the title of tonight's message, Jesus Christ, the true vine. And he mentions that, you know, uh, we are the branches. Uh, if you remember the song in Sunday school, you know, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. We used to sing that all the time growing up. But uh, and then we have God, the father, he's the husbandman. Okay. And so, you know, most of uh, we've got some gardeners in here that know a little bit about gardening, but you do when you have a garden, uh, you know, you have vines and there's fruit that grows. And one of the things that you do as a husbandman, you take care of those things. You know, you purge bad branches out and you take care of those that are producing fruit because the whole goal of everything, you want to produce fruit. You want to get something out of it. And I believe that God wants us to produce fruit for sure. I believe that God wants us as believers when, uh, when we get saved, God wants us winning other people. He wants us to be productive Christians. And that's one thing that we need to, uh, you know, remember in our lives that, you know, being a Christian, it's not about us just getting saved so we can go to heaven. Thank God. If we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saved. We're on our way to heaven, whether you bear fruit or not. Okay. But understand that we weren't saved by works, but we were saved unto good works. And I believe that one of the main works that God wants us to do, obviously he wants us to glorify him. God wants us to live clean, holy, and pure lives, but he wants us to produce fruit. And a lot of people, when it comes to, you know, in a lot of churches today, you know, they do, they like the Bible. They like the things of God. They There's people that have figured out that, you know what? If you live your life according to the principles of the Bible, you raise your family according to the principles of the Bible, there's benefits to it. If you uh, handle your finances according to the principles of the Bible, there's benefits to it. There's a lot of great benefits to being a part of a church. You can make good friends. You 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 get encouraged by hearing the preaching of the Word of God. You can come and enjoy the singing and the fellowship. There's a lot of great things, but a lot of people, they get all those things, but they forget that, you know what, I'm supposed to bear fruit. And if we're not bearing fruit as a church, if we're not getting people saved, then why are we even here? You know, why should God even bless our church? Why should God bless me as an individual if I'm not doing anything to bear fruit? It's amazing how many churches there are that, you know, they might have 50, 100, or even 200 people, but... It's the same people every year. You know, there's never any growth. They're never, they're never winning souls. They're not out, they're not out knocking the doors. They're not out spreading the gospel. You know, they are comfortable the way things are. Okay, we've got enough people here. The bills are being paid. Uh, you know, we've got enough people here. We're able to have some fellowship. Uh, you know, we're able to get encouraged. I'm following enough of the Bible that I'm happy. My family's happy. Everything's going great. But they forget we're supposed to bear fruit. And you know what happens in churches like this too? Is usually when you have a church that just sit around doing nothing, not bearing fruit. Those are the churches where people, they do, they get idle. And that's usually where all the busybodies congregate. And before long, you know, the pastor's like, "Ah, I'd like to see a little bit of improvement in the people. And he starts preaching against a certain sin. And then people people all of a sudden are uncomfortable. And so then that's when all the backbiting goes and they're, they're all, the, all the tattling starts happening. Hey, this person isn't doing what the pastor preaches. And then it's just, 
becomes one of these churches where everybody's just judging each other and backbiting each other. And listen, when churches that are out winning souls, they don't usually get caught up in that stuff. You know, I think one of the best ways to get rid of gossip in the church and just get rid of tattling and backbiting is just to get people busy out doing what they're supposed to do and bearing fruit. And that, that is, that's the main purpose of what we are supposed to be doing. And, you know, Jesus, we see he is the true vine. He is the source of life, okay? You know, you can't just go get a branch and, you know, take that branch by itself and expect fruit to come from it. You know, it's got to come from the vine and Jesus Christ. He is the source of life and branches can't grow or produce fruit without him. You know, we need to, and that's why we need to abide in Christ. We need to stay close to Christ if we are going to bear fruit. And you say, well, for, you know, if we're the branches, you know, can we not become branches anymore? Or can we get broken off? And, I, and we'll, we'll cover that here in a little bit. But I, I do believe that if, as believers, once again, we can't lose our salvation. But if we do not abide in Christ, if we do not stay close to Him, we will not bear fruit. We will not produce anything. And, and so, you know, where the branches, our job, bear fruit. We're completely useless. We're good for nothing unless we are connected to the vine. And unless, and unless we are bearing fruit, we're good for nothing. We might as well just be cut off and cast in the fire and burn. And we see God as the husbandman. He's the one that removes branches that don't bear fruit. And he purges those that do bear fruit. And so, uh, you know, how, what does that mean for him to remove the branches? Well, I don't know. Maybe it means we die. You know, we stop wasting time. Or maybe, you know, God just quits using us. You know, God, you know, we don't have the hand of God on us anymore. And I think that can happen in a lot of churches too. Where, you know, God just finally says, you know what? I'm out of this place. And we see in Revelation where he talked about removing the candlestick from a church. And I do, I believe there's churches that they, they get to a point and God's just like, you know, enough's enough. You know, y'all are just a social club now. And he leaves and that church is on their own. And some of those churches are doing just fine, numerically speaking, but they are just social clubs. They're not winning people to Christ. And so if we're, if we're going to be fruit bearing Christians, you know, we do, we got to abide in Christ. We got to stay close to Christ and let God purge us. Let God get things out of our life. Let God, uh, you know, Im improve us. And sometimes it's a painful process. But listen, we need to allow God to do a work in our life. You need to allow God to speak to your heart through his, through the word, through the preaching. You, we need to take preaching personal. When you hear preaching, any message that you come to hear, you need to just assume that it's, it's to you. You know, that God, and you know, maybe if, and if I'm hitting on something that I have no way of knowing about, and you know, whatever I'm preaching, I just think, you know, God probably gave the past that message for me. God wanted me to hear this message and whatever it's about, whatever it is, the subject is being spoke on. You ought to take it personal and say, you know what? The Lord is probably trying to teach me something and I need to fix this. And we shouldn't have this attitude of, you know, of, you know, you go get them, pastor, you know, go preach it at everybody else, but not at me. No, it ought to be, you know, this is for me. This is directed at me. God wanted me to hear this. God has me in this church because what this pastor preaches is what I need. And God wants me to hear these messages and he wants me to change. And it stinks to change. It's hard. You know, we don't change very easily, but that's what God wants from us. He's trying to purge us so we can bear more fruit. And I believe that happens often in churches too. You know, you have, sometimes there's church splits and that's always devastating when a church has a split. But you know what? Sometimes I think God's doing it. God's purging the church. I, you know, we're supposed to purge ourselves too. Paul said to purge out the leaven. You know, if there's somebody that comes in here bringing in false doctrine, you know what? We should purge it ourselves. You know, we should throw those people out. You know, and it, it's important that we, uh, that we work on these things in our, in our life. You know, you ought to, by yourself, you know, purge yourself. You know, you should read the Bible, listen to the preaching, and get things out of your life. You know, don't wait, don't make God hit you upside the head with things. You know, don't make God send a catastrophe your way. You know, don't make God, you know, chasing you. You know, just do it yourself. 
Just listen to the still small voice and let God change you. And so look at verse 6. He says, or, or before that he had said, for without me you can do nothing. And he said, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Okay, And this is where some people might try to take this and say, you know, if you don't abide in Christ, if you don't stay close to Christ, then he's going to, you know, he's going to break you off and you're going to be cast in the fire. And that's a picture of hell. All right. And that's, that's what people will try to do with that passage. But the branches that are being burned, I don't believe, I don't believe for one second, it's proof that you can lose your salvation. And what, and listen, even if, you know, we need, this is just kind of another rule for when you're studying the Bible that we need to follow. Okay. And that is, you know, you should never allow symbolism or a parable to overrule clear verses of scripture. All right. That is just, listen, you know, there's a lot of great rules that, you know, I have and I, I try to teach people when studying the Bible. And this is one of them that you need to get, you know, never use symbolism or a parable to overrule clear verses of scripture. It is very easy to misinterpret a parable. It's real easy. And, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of parables that are in the Bible that people have taken them and run with them. You know, I mean, think about the, the parable of the prodigal son, for example. Okay, you know, the parable of the prodigal son, most people don't even know the, what that parable is really all about. That What that parable is really all about was about the older brother who hated the younger brother. And it was a picture of the Jews having a problem with, you know, these all these wicked sinners that were getting saved thinking you know they don't deserve to have a relationship with God if you look at the context of everything that's what it's all about but we usually focus on you know the prodigal and how he wasted and, and there's great lessons we can learn from that but that's not the main you know purpose of that parable and we often miss those things there's a lot of other examples like that I can give but you know we it's easy to misinterpret a parable and so you never let a parable overrule a clear scripture and we have so many clear scriptures that you can't lose your salvation we have verses like we looked at last week you know neither can any man pluck them out of my father's hand that's pretty clear right there you know and there's so many passages that make it clear you can't lose your salvation you can't take this passage here where they throw a branch and it's burned and say that that's what happens if you don't stay close to christ you're going to hell that's just that's just bad uh bad Bible interpretation when you do that. And this passage, I think, could just be a reference to physical Israel who had rejected their Messiah. Turn over to Romans chapter 11. If you watch the interview I did with Pastor First last night, it was interesting because he brought this, he brought this very thing up. He brought up Romans chapter 11 and John 15 and how they apply. And it was interesting because I had just put this message together that day and I, I had that all my notes, but I, I totally agreed with them on this. And Romans chapter 11, verse 11 says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, talking about the Jews, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted among them, with, uh, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Okay? Now, once again, Paul here, he's kind of speaking symbolically here. But understand the context of this here 
in Romans chapter 11, you know, he asked the question, in, in uh, Romans 10, 13, chapter before, he said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. And it's like there's a question, well, what about these Jews who had rejected Christ? And he says in verse 1, you know, had God cast away his people, God forbid. You know, for I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. You know what Paul was saying here, he's teaching in this chapter, is Jews can be saved. Even though as a people, they rejected Christ, and even though they were, as the natural branches were broken off because of unbelief, he's saying they can be grafted back in if they'll believe on Christ. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, including Jews. Okay? There is no difference between Jew and Greek. You know, God has concluded them all in unrighteousness. And it's clear in the Bible that as a people, the, uh, the Jews, the natural branches, they were broken off. Okay? But understand, to be, they can be grabbed back in if they will believe on Christ. And it's the same thing too. And we see here that, you know, they rejected salvation, had gone to the Gentiles. And when he's telling them, you know, be not high minded, but fear, we shouldn't get this attitude as Gentiles. Well, wow, we're really something special because you know what? God can quit dealing with us too and go to somebody else. And so uh, in Romans chapter 11, I don't think, you know, he's talking about, you know, when he talks about, you know, branches being able to be removed, he's not talking about you as a saved individual being broken off of Christ. But he's talking about it as a group of people. And I believe as a church, I believe, you know, we are, you know, we are God's church. Uh, you know, I believe Jesus Christ is the shepherd of this church. But you know what? If somewhere down the line, down the road, we get away from God, you know, I believe as a church, we can be history. We can be done for. Does that mean the saved people in here are going to lose their salvation? No. But you know what? I believe if we're not careful, I believe it's possible you can get to a point where in a church where there's nobody, no, no saved people in the church. And I believe there's a lot of churches out there where there aren't any saved people. Did it used to be that way? Some of these churches that are 150 years old, the church that we went to when we got married, that was a, they had just celebrated their 100th anniversary where the pastor preached that he had to be baptized to go to heaven. You know, I don't think there was any saved people in that church. I mean, it was just, it was ridiculous what we heard there. Now, did there, was there at one time saved people in that church? Probably. But you know what? That church, I believe, it got broken off the vine. I believe, and I believe God's done with churches like that. Doesn't mean any individuals lost their salvation. And so I believe that when we see that in Romans chapter 11, you know, he's talking about, uh, you know, groups of people. And, uh, and so for us to take, you know, John chapter 15 and try to apply it to an individual, they can lose their salvation, I think, is wrong. And when we see too, throughout the book of John, you know, and throughout the Gospels, you know, Jesus, he's preaching to the Jews. He's trying to get the Jews to believe him and accept him as a Messiah, and they, they would not do it. And so he warned them over and over again, you know, that, you know, the kingdom's going to be taken from you and given to another nation. We see in uh, John uh, chapter 3, I preached on Sunday, you know, he tried to tell them, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nobody's going to inherit a kingdom just because of their bloodline. They have to be of faith. And it is clear that the Jews, who were God's people that time, they did not abide in Christ. They rejected Christ. And they were, they were broken off. But thank God, when it came to individuals, God would save them. The Apostle Paul, for an example. And everybody, you know, people do. On Romans chapter 11... I just want to, I want to slap people sometimes, you know, that God's not done with Israel and they'll take Romans, you know, had God cast away his people, you know, God forbid. And they act like that's talking about some future thing. Well, read the next verse, people. All right. One of my other rules about studying things, you know, whenever people start talking stupidity, saying things that don't line up with the Bible, just read the next verses and, you know, it'll clear itself up. And when Paul said that, he wasn't saying no because God's got a future plan for Israel. He said no. I'm proof. He was one who was saved, you know, after the Jews rejected Christ. 
after the Jews had uh, you know, uh, rejected him, even after the resurrection. He was one of the Jews that actually persecuted the church. And yet, God saved him. Because God wasn't done with Israel. If they would believe, he would save them. And it's the same thing today. That is not a reference to some future event. And once again, that's because these people, they quit using the King James Bible and using the Schofield Bible. And if you watched the interview last night, you know, Schofield, man, I'm telling you, he's, he's a bad word. Uh, <laughs> but I, I've got a Schofield Bible, but it's a King James Bible too. So it's like, is it right to get rid of it? <laughs> You just have to ignore the notes. I'm mean, going to go white out all the notes and those things. But anyway, uh, that, that's a little rabbit trail there. I don't want to go down. But uh, look at verse 7. It says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Now we talked about this a little bit last week about loving God and keeping his commandments. Okay. Sometimes people will take passages where it talks about keep, you know, if, if you, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments and things like that. And they'll, they'll act like, you know, if you're not keeping his commandments, you're not saved. No, it doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means you don't love him. And if you are, not, if you don't love God, if you don't, then you're not going to abide in His love. What does that mean? Does it mean that God quits loving us if we don't keep His commandments? You know what is, you know, what does that mean exactly? You know, and I believe when we abide in Christ, you know, we're going to want what He wants. You know, we're going to have the same attitude He has. You know, He wants us to bear fruit. That's what he's been talking about this whole chapter here. He's been talking about bearing fruit. And when he says, ye shall ask it what ye will, and it shall be done unto you, this is not our opportunity to ask for that Corvette or that Mercedes or whatever. What's he been talking about? He wants us to bear fruit. And if we abide in him, you know, we will. We will, we will bear fruit. We will do what we're supposed to do. And, when he, and then he talks about us abiding in his love. You know, and as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. So is it possible for God to quit loving us? Well, not in the sense of the love where we see for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We see that God has an unconditional love for us. But sometimes, and I've talked about this before. When the Bible talks about love, it's not always referring to a feeling. It's referring to action. And if you are not keeping God's commandments, then he is not going to be bestowing love on you in the sense of, you know, blessing you. Okay. And what's one of the ways that we love our wives? You know, we buy them flowers. You know, you, you buy them something. Don't look at me like I never get you flowers. I get you flowers sometimes. (laughs) Just got just got a funny look from my, but you know we uh, you know we show these things you know or the wife I talk about the wife you know she shows by making steak you know every meal for her husband when was the last time I had steak you know talk about, you know we we you know we bring up and, and don't say if you pay for it <laughs> go kill a cow you know but uh, you know, uh, you know we th- these are things that we do and, and these are these are love that's a, that's us loving them us doing good things to them being kind to them, giving them blessings. And if we will abide in his love, you know, if, if uh, you know, we will be keeping his commandments. And when we keep his commandments, that's us loving him. And he loves us right back. Talked about it last week. You had John, the beloved disciple. He was one who laid on Jesus breast. He was close to him. He had people like, you know, Mary and Martha and Lazarus that loved him. And as they would just, you know, show that love for him, He showed that love right back. And if we will abide in his love and we do that by keeping his commandments, then he's going to bestow his love on us. We're going to get blessed right back. And we see the main commandments that we see in here is that we're supposed to bear fruit and we're supposed to love one another. Those are the commands. God wants us as Christian people 
The way we abide in his love is we bear fruit and we love one another. If we will do those things, we will abide in his love. In other words, and we will continue to get the blessings. We will continue to be blessed by God. And I do. I want our church to abide in God's love. So I want us to keep winning souls. I want us to keep loving each other. I want us to keep the backbiting and the bickering and the, you know, the gospel and all that stuff out because I want God's blessings on our church because if we're not careful, we can lose God's love. Not in the sense of, you know, God's all of a sudden going to hate us and throw us in hell, but no, we're going to lose the love. We're going to lose the blessings. We're going to lose, we're going to lose those things that, uh, that I know I want. And so that's what that's talking about. So then look at verse 13. He said, because in verse 12, he mentioned, this is my commandment. Okay. We abide in him, his love by keeping his commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. And this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Okay. You love each other the way I love you. And then he says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Okay? Not everybody's just automatically a friend. We've got this attitude today, we sometimes, you know, that we're supposed to be friends with everybody. Well, listen, we're supposed to treat everybody like our neighbor, but you know, we're not going to be friends with everybody. And, you know, if, if you're going to be a friend with somebody, you got to have certain things in common, don't you? There's a certain things you're going to have. I think we ought to be friendly to everybody. But you're not, you're not just going to automatically be friends with everybody. That's just, you know, that's a stupid attitude that we all got to give equal time. You know, that if, if I call Brother Mark this week and talk to him on the phone, that means I got to call Brother Lonnie and Brother Pete and Brother Eric. I got to give you all equal time because, you know, we got to have fairness. You know, if you invite, if your kid invites one person over, you got to invite all the kids over. You know, that kind of stuff is just stupid. All right. You know, we don't need to get caught up in that stuff. Some people are going to be closer to other people. Because, why? Because they have, they have more in common. And listen, not everybody is a friend of God. Notice how it was Abraham that was referred to as a friend of God. Well, isn't God friends with everybody? Not as much as some people. And obviously there was something special about Abraham because he was called a friend of God. Made special note of that. But he says, you're my friends. If ye do whatsoever, I command you. There's, that's conditional right there. Verse 15 Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Uh, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you that you love one another. So right there again, we see, you know, what service you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Is that asking for money? Is that asking to win the lottery? What's he been talking about this whole passage about bringing forth fruit? There, listen, if you want to pray for new cars, houses, that's fine. But you know what? I think what God wants us praying for is that we, God will give us fruit. Lord, help me to bear fruit. And understand, if, you're, if God's going to answer that prayer, He might need to purge you. He might need to you know, purge you of your TV time. You know, that way, you'll actually have time to study your Bible so you'll know how to be a witness. You know, God might have to change you. That way, you know, you, you'll maybe ha- actually have a good testimony and be able to win somebody to Christ. And so... You know, we need to understand that, you know, God loved the whole world when he sent his son, but, you know, not everyone's going to be his friend. Not everyone is called to be a disciple and not everyone is treated equal. And I believe we're all treated fair, but, you know, some people are going to be more blessed than others. If you're keeping more of the commandments, if you're bearing more fruit, we see examples of that in the Bible where, you know, if, if the tree that's bearing the fruit that's the one that's going to be taken care of. That's the one that's going to be receiving more of the blessings. We see in the Bible, you know, in our American mentality, it, it totally throws us with the parable of the man with the five talents, the three, you had one with the three, one with one. And, you know, you see when they took the one away from the person who didn't do anything with it, 
He didn't give it to the one with three. He gave it to the one with, or the, you know, the ten talents. Shouldn't he have given it to the guy who ended up with six talents? You know, help level the playing field, help spread the wealth? No, he gave the one with ten. Why? Because he's producing the most. He's getting the most done. There's nothing wrong with that. And have you ever seen some of these people and some of these churches seem like they just get all the blessings? Well, you know what? Maybe it's because they're using everything they have for God. And maybe if we're, if you feel like I'm not getting blessed because you know you don't maybe you feel like I don't, you don't have very much, it's because you're not using the little that you do have. Use what you do have, and God will multiply it. And so you know this isn't about fairness and leveling the playing field. That's an American thing, folks. That it doesn't come from the Bible. That's not biblical to do that. And some people are going to be more blessed. Why? Because they're keep they're keeping the commandments. They're bringing forth fruit. They're the ones getting people saved. So God's going to do things. The churches that are making a difference, God is going to bless those churches more than those who aren't making a difference. Those churches are going to be getting you know more people. They're going to be getting more money. I mean, all these things that everybody seems to want in churches, God's going to give it to the ones who are accomplishing something. So if we want some of that blessing, we need to go accomplish something. We need to bear fruit. That is what God wants from us. And I do. I believe God's going to bless and so, you know, those with the most possessions, you know, physical possessions, they're not necessarily the most blessed, but those, I believe it's those with the most happiness. Proverbs, look at Proverbs chapter 10. A lot of times we make the mistake of thinking, you know, the blessings are just material things. And that's a huge mistake. That's a huge error to think that. But I love this verse, Proverbs 10, 22 says the blessing of the Lord it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. Okay, if, if, if the blessing is all about material things, then, you know, we should all, you know, then obviously Joel Osteen's church is the best church. I mean, God is just pouring the blessings in that. And we hear that all the time, too. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I, I love visiting churches, and I like going to meetings, and you'll go into these churches and they've got these big, massive palaces. I mean, just I mean, just millions of dollars have been poured into these buildings, and you know, people just look and they preach, "Wow, you know, Lord's doing a great work here. You know, Lord's doing a great work. You know, look how look how big this place is. Look how beautiful the building is. You know, look how many." And it's all about the possessions, you know. And then you got these Twitter, these some of these preachers on Twitter too. You know, it's just it gets it gets annoying sometimes. But you know, anytime they get any new thing, new car, you know. It's always, you know, hashtag blessed. And you say, you know, well, what's wrong with that? Well, here's, here's what they're really trying to say is, you know, look at what God is doing for me. You know, look at how God is blessing me. I must be doing something right. And I know some preachers that are like that. I mean, just constantly. And these, these guys do too. I mean, their churches, they've got money. These preachers got money. They're always tweeting all their, uh, you know, Fancy cars are buying, fancy clothes, you know, and all these things, and always just hashtagging it, bless, just giving all the glory to God. No, you're not. You know, you're showing everybody just how you know great God thinks you are, and it's you know because of material blessings. But folks, that's not the blessing, okay? Because if that's the case, if these people are blessed because of the trucks they drive and the houses they live in then Donald Trump's one of the most blessed men in America. Not only does he have all his fancy houses, he's got the White House right now. I mean, good night. Isn't that man blessed of God? Look at all his stuff. You know, Jews are the blessed people. You know, look how much money they've got. You know, everybody knows they've got all the money. You know, obviously they're the most blessed, right? No, listen, the blessing of the Lord it maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow with it. Why is it that we think these possessions are such huge blessings? It's because we think those things will make us happy. But do those things make people happy? Absolutely not. That's why there's a, you know, a lot of rich people on drugs, a lot of rich people struggling with alcoholism, a lot of rich people commit suicide because they can't enjoy these things. Why? Because they don't have the blessing of God on their life. These things do not mean the blessing of God. And so the thing that will bring you the most happiness is being used of God. 
That'll, bring, that'll give you happiness. Knowing that you're in the will of God. Knowing that you're being used of God. You know, one of the, you know whenever we face challenges, you know, or whenever trials come our way, you know, one of the things that's tough about those is when you're like, is this, be, you know, am I being chastened of God? You know, am I being punished by God? And that's tough. But listen, when you know you're in the will of God, those things don't bother you. You know, when you get persecuted and you know it's because it's for the right thing, it it doesn't bother you. It doesn't bother me at all. It doesn't bother me what people think and some of the things that people say about me because God has given me full assurance that I'm right, that I'm in his will. And it literally doesn't bother me at all. I saw a thing on, on the news the other day, too. They were trying to talk, you know, blame everybody else for transgender people wanting to commit suicide all the time. You know, it has nothing to do with them mutilating their body and messing with their hormones and all the things they do. It's all because of us haters, you know, that have a problem with them. It's because, you know, some somebody called him or her when hers wanted to be a him. And they committed suicide. And that's, and, you know, and that's our fault. But listen... You know why they're miserable? It's because they are not in the will of God. They know they are not doing the right thing. They know that, and therefore they are miserable. But listen, when you are in the will of God, when you know you're doing the right thing, it doesn't bother you. You can have peace when all that's going on, and you can have joy, and you can have real happiness, the real blessings, peace and contentment, even when you're poor, even when people are saying bad things about you, even when you know trials come your way, you can still enjoy life and enjoy what you have. That's the blessing of the Lord right there. And you get that when you abide in Christ, when you keep His commandments, when you're bringing forth fruit. And so look at verse 18. It says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. I had not come and spoken unto them, or if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had no sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. This is kind of a side note here. This is just bonus. I, I was thinking about this verse today because I believe when it comes to, you know, we've been fighting against this pre-trib and Zionism stuff. And I believe one of the reasons people are fighting so hard back and getting so mad about it is because it's almost like at the time of the ignorance God winked at. But it's like now it's out. Now the secret's out. This is a lie. It's a fraud. And they're angry because they can't stay in blissful ignorance anymore. These people, they know the truth. There's no cloak for their sin anymore. You know, it was one thing when all the Bible colleges were teaching the same thing. You know, when all the, pre, you know, when it, you know, all the establishment was teaching it, there was a lot of innocent people that were just following what they were taught. But you know what? The word's out. People have been preaching this, you know, they, through the things like the internet. I mean, it is out there and these people have no cloak for their sin anymore. No excuse to be following that doctrine anymore. And that's just a bonus note there. That, this verse was on my heart today. But verse 23, he that hateth me, hateth my father also. If I had done among them the works which uh, none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify me, and ye ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. So a few things I want to show you in here. uh, First, in verse 18, 19, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. I preached on this not too long ago about the world hating us. But listen, they don't hate us, they hate Jesus. Okay? He said, right, he said, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. We can't take it personal. Okay? We, it's, it's not 
about us. There's not something wrong with you when the world hates you. The, they have, the world has no reason to hate Tommy McMurtry in the flesh. There's no reason for the world to hate Tommy McMurtry, the natural man. No reason. Because I'm made out of the same dirt that they're made out of. They have no reason to hate me, but they can't help but hate the spiritual man. Because it's of Christ. That's what they hate. Okay? They hate Christ. They hate the message. That's what, that's what they hate. That's what the world doesn't like. If it's just me, the world's going to be fine with me. But it's Christ that they hate. And I'm telling you, these people that are out there that are trying to blame Bible preachers for you know, bringing reproach in the name of Christ, I'm just like, where do you people come from? Where do you get the idea that the world's supposed to love Jesus? The world hated Jesus back then. They killed him. They crucified him. They hated him. And yet we've got this, you know, you got all these trendies that are out there trying to figure out how to make themselves lovable to the community. Well, listen, it's not hard to be lovable to the community if you just, all you have to do is get in the flesh, get carnal, have fleshly music, dress like them, act like them, talk like them, and they will love you. But if you start acting like Christ, you start talking like Christ, you get filled with his spirit, they're going to hate you. They're not going to like it. That's just life. And these people who are, I believe they're the ones bringing reproach in the name of Christ. Listen, if something's done in the name of Christ, well, then we ought to be doing what Christ said. We ought to be like Christ. And Jesus Christ was not loved by the world. He was hated by the world. And they are bringing reproach in the name of Christ. They're talking about another Jesus. And we need to make sure we don't get caught up in that. That's just a bunch of garbage. What these people are, they're just afraid of persecution. That's all there is to it. They're cowards. They're, you know, they're, uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I want to be, I'm going to steal a line here. Another pastor, I, I heard this line. It was great. Pastor Tomlinson, he says, you know, like, I want to be one of these, you know, he, he was, somebody told me he wants to be one of these middle of the road Baptists. And, you know, and that's all up. I, I just want to be middle of the road. You know, it sounds good, right? And he's like, he's like, you know what's in the middle of the road? A yellow line. Just like on their backs. And you know, that's the problem with these people. They're wanting to be middle of the road. You know, not middle of the road with this being the middle of the road, but you know, in between, you know, somewhere with religion in the world. And you know what? Yeah, yellow line in the middle of the road, yellow line in their back. They're just a bunch of cowards. I don't, you know, let me tell you, it's no fun being a coward. You know, I can't imagine how I would feel just knowing I was a spineless wimp. I would just think that life would be pathetic that way. I'm telling you, it's a lot more fun. Life's a lot more enjoyable going against the flow. Life's a lot more fun when you actually you know, stir things up every now and then and cause a little bit of trouble. I don't know. And I, I got to watch it because I enjoy some of it. And I got to make sure I'm doing these things for the right reason. But I'm telling you right now, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting fed up with these jellyfish that are out there that just don't want to stand for anything just get involved get in the fight and just you know if you are seeking to be loved just admit you're a coward all right jesus he didn't care he told the truth he only did the things that please the father he did the will of the father and the world hated him for it and they'll hate us too and so while no one denies that people uh, that the people that Jesus had short encounters with got saved, they struggle with believing the ones we have short encounters with get saved. What are you talking about? Verse, verse 20, look what he says. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also per persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Now keep this in mind. I could preach a whole message on this. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Okay? When people reject what we are trying to, to bring them, they're rejecting Christ. When we go out knocking on doors and we give people the gospel and they reject it, they're not rejecting us, they're rejecting Christ. Jesus said that it's the same thing. And you know what, I was thinking about that because you know people do, they, they question all the time whether these people that we give the gospel to really get saved or not. But yet, we all believe the woman at the well got saved. Jesus had a short encounter with her 
and she got saved. Well, but you, you know, she changed her life. We know she got in church and she got baptized. Well, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us about that, does it? Why doesn't the Bible tell us about the woman at the well getting rid of the guy she was shacking up with? Why doesn't the Bible tell us about that? Maybe because it wasn't necessary for salvation. Maybe because it wasn't proof for salvation. You know, that Ethiopian eunuch, Philip had a short encounter with him. He got saved. Well, but he got baptized. And we know he went to church after that and he started sold. Do we? We don't know that. Why doesn't the Bible tell us about those things? Maybe because those things weren't necessary. I think one of the main reasons it tells us about the baptism is because that eunuch's like, hey, here's water. You know, I want to be baptized. What's hindering me to be baptized? And he tells him, well, if you want to get baptized, you've got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to believe in Him. And we, do, we see all these examples in the Bible of short encounters that Jesus would have with people, and everybody believes they got saved, and the Bible doesn't always tell us about their changed life that took place after that, but we all agree they got saved, but yet, when we have short encounters with people, that doesn't count. We got to get them into church first. We got to do this. We got to do that. But listen, if Jesus had a short encounter with somebody out there and they prayed, we all would believe they got saved. But it's the same thing. If they receive our saying, it's receiving his saying. If they reject our saying, they're rejecting his saying. Because this is not our message, folks. And God has sent us to be the ones to go and give the gospel. It's our job to be the preaching and to do the footwork and it is. Their rejection of our message is a rejection of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying right there in that passage. And so, you know, the, uh, you know, the reason the world hates us and our message is because we take away the fun of their sin. We're ruining their fun. Listen, we're, churches like ours, we're ruining everybody's fun on Israel Sunday. We're ruining all these Zionists Things you know, we're, you know, we're driving these people crazy. You know, their you know supports being threatened is going to be threatened as as these guys get exposed. We are ruining their fun. We're ruining the fun of people who are just fine with not worrying about tribulation, not being ready, you know, for the things that are to come, not living for God. They were they were fine with just thinking, you know, I might not have to pay my bills tomorrow. They were all fine with that. We're ruining all their fun. By speaking the truth on these things. And we ruin the world's fun. The world is all in agreement that perversion is okay. But you know what? There's these Bible thumpers out there saying, no, it's not. And it drives them crazy. They, because we do, we like, you know, misery loves company. And when we sin, we like having, you know, the approval of everybody. And that's why a lot, you know, teenagers, a lot of times when they get in trouble, it's usually with a friend. Why is that? Well, Usually when they're young, they've still got a conscience. But when you've got somebody with you, it makes it not seem as bad. And let me tell you, we are, we are ruining the world's fun by preaching what we preach about homosexuality, by preaching what we preach about adultery and divorce. And all these things. People hate that stuff. And you know what? We're going to keep ruining their fun. They have no cloak for their sin, no excuse. And so while the world has many reasons for hating God, none of them are justified. We see you know, he, uh, in verse 24, if I had done among them the works which, were, which none other man did, they had not had sin, but now they have both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. It was prophesied they would do that. They hated Him without a cause. There's no reason for hating God. There's no reason for hating Jesus Christ. And you know what? There's no reason for hating us. There's no reason for hating us who preach the truth. None at all. But they do. You know, they have reasons, but they're not good ones. You know, their reasons are we ruin their fun. You know, we're shining a light when they love darkness. That's why they hate us, but that's not a good reason. And so the Holy Spirit... Always, we see the Holy Spirit always points people to Jesus Christ, and we should do the same. Verse 26 and 27, he talks about the comfort that's going to come, even the Spirit of truth. You know, he will testify of me, he says. The Holy Spirit will testify of me. Talking about Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will testify of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit 
points people to Jesus Christ. And ye also shall bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning. Talking to those disciples, you're going to bear witness of me. And that's exactly what the disciples did. They got filled with the Holy Ghost. And what did they do? They preached Jesus. They went and they spread the gospel all around the world, pointing people to Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And that's what we are supposed to do. We are supposed to point people to Jesus Christ. And when we go out soul winning, listen, we, we invite people to our church. Nothing wrong with that. That's kind of the icebreaker. But listen, the main goal of soul winning is not to point people to our church. Listen, if, we, if they look too close to this church, they're just going to see a bunch of sinners like them. Our main job when we're out there soul winning is to point people to Jesus Christ. We're supposed to preach the gospel right there. Point them to Jesus Christ. Everybody today... You know, they all just want to do the door hangers, you know, come to our church, you know, come, you know, come visit our church and you know, be a part of our church and, you know, see what we do here. Come have fun. We got these great kids programs, great music, great food, you know, great coffee, you know, all these things, you know, they'll, they'll point to all these things, you know, come and, you know, be a part, you know, and, you know, let's have community together. They'll do all these things, but listen, we're supposed to be pointing people to Christ. We're supposed to be bearing witness of Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And we pray these people get saved. And then, if they get saved, hopefully we can get them into church. And get them around the things of God, around the people of God, so we can encourage them. And so, you know, God can purge them. And so they could bear fruit. So they could win people to Christ. That is the goal. And so the whole point of abiding in Jesus Christ, the true vine, abiding Him is not so we will stay saved. If you're saved, you're saved. The whole point of abiding in Jesus Christ, the true vine, is so we can be His disciples and we can bear fruit. That is what we are here for. That is our job. It was the job of the Jewish people. God had given the physical nation of Israel the oracles of God. They were the ones that had the Scripture. They were the ones that had the law. They were the ones that God were used for years and years and years. But you know what? They rejected Jesus Christ. They failed. And you know what? Those branches were broken off. And you know what? Now God is using local churches. God is using people like us. And we need to make sure that we are bearing fruit. That we abide in Christ. Otherwise, God will break our church off. We're not going to lose our salvation but we won't be used of God anymore. We won't be blessed of God. We will not bring forth any fruit. We will be, when, talk about, when we're cast away into the fire, it's not that we're going into hell, but what do you do with those branches that fall from your tree or that you break from the tree? You burn them. They're good for nothing. You burn them. You get rid of them. There's no point in it being there anymore. And you know what? If we're not bearing fruit, there is no point for this church being here. Absolutely none. God might as well just break us off, be done with us, and go focus His blessing on someone else who's actually bringing forth fruit. And I believe that's the message of John chapter 15. So with that, let's all stand together.